Hey, it's Lee with Tooth of the Arrow Broadheads. We're here with Dr. Brian Hauk for our second video. If you didn't see the first video I did with Dr. Hauk, make sure you check it out right here. It was a full breakdown from a surgeon's perspective on shot placement, the theory and philosophy of shot placement, why common shot placement thought might not be as correct as you think, broadhead selection, and so much more. It was a huge amount of content, and we still didn't feel like we covered enough. You guys love the video, so we're here doing part two. So if you don't know Dr. Hauk, if you haven't seen it, he's actually my dad, and he has been a doctor for a surgeon 30, 35 years, mm -hmm. hunting just as long. He's got you know, well over 100 species taken around the world. Like He's saved a lot of lives, and he's ended a lot of lives hunting, so he knows what he's talking about. Um, today we're talking more about shot placement in the sense of after your shot has happened and you walk up you find your arrow you find what your what blood or lack thereof is on the ground and you have to make that crucial decision as a bow hunter of how long are you going to wait to track that animal realistically how long is it going to die based on what you're seeing in that moment on the information you have available to you let's get right into it i mean obviously the first thing when you're bow hunting you shoot an animal the first thing you want to find is your arrow it tells you as much of the story as you have. So um, what would you like to see if you're walking up to an arrow? Well, first of all, I think the most important thing is that you find that arrow. You know, getting a pass through is critical. Um, when it comes to killing that animal and killing it as quickly and efficiently as possible, you know, there's no question that penetration is the most important thing. Placement, of course, is extremely important as well. Um, but you know we'll, we'll go through some of the uh, anatomy some of why that's so important we covered some of it in the initial video there was a number of very good detailed questions that come out of it which we're going to uh, expand upon and not that you're ever going to know as you take that shot i mean you'll have a pretty good idea of your hit hopefully but of course you're it, it's just interesting to be able to understand why some of those hits pass-throughs, not pass-throughs will kill an animal quickly, uh, more slowly, etc. So yeah, I mean, it, I, I've shot animals with a bow where you don't find your arrow and it can be really stressful not knowing exactly what's happening. So when you find your arrow, it can tell you a lot of the story. So let's say um, you find your arrow and what, what kind of blood are you going to see on your arrow for? Let's We're going to break them all down, but let's start with your heart lung shot. Um, what you're aiming for, what are you gonna come, what are you gonna see on the end of your arrow? So, you know, when you look at that arrow, it's gonna be, again, another piece of information. You're never going to know uh, how effective and how efficient at killing the animal that shot was. But, you know, the things we look at, little piece of information, arterial blood is a brighter red in color. That's good, if you hit an artery, you've got the whole blood pressure of the heart forcing blood out. It's good. Uh, if the blood looks dark in color, sort of almost dark red, bluish, that's venous blood. <clears throat> so you hit something that's venous, you're not gonna have nearly the pressure uh, forcing blood out. So again, depending on the size of the vessel, um, you know, a small artery is going to bleed a lot slower, a big artery is going to bleed a lot faster, um, and same with the venous. But it, so it's just a piece of information that, that that's fine, that's part of the hunt. Um, obviously, you know, if there's bowel content, then you know you've had a bowel shot, which <clears throat> a lot of implications to that in terms of uh, timing, when do you go after that animal, so important piece of information. Um, you know, you've, you've heard about the blood that may have some gas or air in it. Now that's a very, very tricky one. I, I don't know if I really trust it. So the idea is if it passes through the lungs, I mean, the lungs are basically a sponge filled with air. And then of course, there's some, a lot of blood vessels going through it as well. But you know, as that arrow comes out um, of a hole, the skin on the other side, um, you know, that's definitely going to change the character of, you know, the, whether there was more air in that blood or not. But those are the, you know, the things that you look at and you just make a note of. 
it's a good point you make about your arrow exiting that animal because if you're shooting, you know, a coos deer, which is which hair is just so fine versus a musk ox, you can have the exact same shot covered in lung blood, and the end of your arrow is going to look different when it comes out. Okay, so let's get into some of the interesting and important things when it comes to understanding why some shots will kill quicker than others. So first of all, when you get your double lung shots, you know what, there's two factors that are gonna uh, contribute to how quickly or, or slowly that animal is gonna die. One is the collapsing of the lungs. So we covered some of this uh, in the first video, not gonna go over all of those details again, but if you can get a double lung shot where the arrow goes in and out, <clears throat> you're gonna have two holes that are gonna allow the lungs to collapse there that is going to be a much quicker kill than if you only have one kill even if it happens to be a double lung shot if it doesn't come out the other side it's going to take be slower for that the lung on that side to collapse and the animal can certainly survive longer so again <clears throat> penetration is the key um, now the second thing is hitting the blood vessels now we're going to look at a diagram here that will just help to understand this. So if you hit blood vessels that are big, um, you're, then you're gonna have the additional factor of blood loss. So if we just look at this diagram here, closer to the heart and the center of the lungs, that's where all the big blood vessels are. So if your arrow happens to go through that and you hit some of those big blood vessels, you're gonna clap the lungs and you're gonna have a lot of very quick blood loss. So the further out you get, from those big blood vessels, you know, the smaller they are and the less bleeding uh, and blood loss it's going to contribute to the kill. So there's no question if you get a shot peripheral, way out in the lungs, you have if you get a double lung shot, the lungs will collapse, that's great. That animal won't necessarily lose that much blood. Uh, so it's going to die from the collapsed lungs. So it's always going to be a matter of you know, the combination of both of those factors. So as you can see here in this diagram, uh, you know, here's the heart coming out. Of course, a heart shot is great. Uh, the big blood vessels coming out. So, you know, your shot placement has to be the best you can. You, you know, your directs, your quarterings towards, quarterings away. But just an understanding of this anatomy and how it kills is interesting and important. It is interesting because being a broadhead manufacturer with Tooth of the Arrow, I hear the question all the time, how are the blood trails? And that's just an incredibly subjective question, right? Something I wanna ask you about is I've made a lot of good double lung shots on animals and I've seen cases where an animal literally runs 15 yards on a double lung mm -hmm. and dies and I've seen cases where they run 150 plus yards and, it's, and I just can't believe that on it. And you break them open and you see, yeah, I made the double lung, but I just can't believe they made it that far. So on the same shot or apparently not the same shot, um, but a double lung, 20 yards versus 150 yards, why does that happen? So again, it's a combination of how quickly the lungs collapse. If you get two good holes where the lungs, the air can basically escape from that pleural cavity, the lungs will collapse. They basically, no oxygenation, they're gonna die faster. Um, if a lung or both are slower to collapse, you know, that animal will be able to continue to breathe for a little bit longer time. And where you hit in terms of the blood loss. So, you know, as I mentioned, the bigger the vessel you hit, the quicker it's going to bleed and then you're going to have the additional factor of blood loss. So it's always a combination of the two. <clears throat> how quickly the lungs collapse, how quickly they lose blood. And then, of course, as I mentioned, you know, arterial blood, they're gonna bleed out faster than a venous blood. So it's just the anatomy and the, the combination of that, those anatomical factors that make the difference. Okay, so then you, you carried us right into the next point. I mean, heart, lung shot, what you're looking for is, in my experience, it's more of a pink blood, almost has a pinkish, very thin kind of look to it, but again, very case by case. But when you see liver blood compared to lung blood, it's unmistakable. and 
And one thing I always do, I've gotten in a real habit of it, is I'll pick up my arrow when I find it and I'll smell it. There's, there's a lot you can tell by the smell of an arrow. A, a lung shot doesn't have any sort of foul smell at all. A liver shot will smell real irony and bloody, really. A uh, gut shot, I mean, it, it smells like guts. You'll be able to smell it from over here. Um, it, so smelling your arrow is a really good habit to get into, but let's talk about that. You get a lot of blood on a liver shot, but why is a liver shot not considered as lethal as a lung shot? Because it certainly isn't. And what would your guidelines be? If, you, if, you're, bow, if you're bow hunting with me and, and we see, yeah, Lee, you made a liver shot, what are we going to do? Are we gonna, how long are we going to wait? So an animal will die on a liver shot only because of blood loss. So the lungs aren't going to collapse unless you happen to hit the liver and it happens to go up into the chest and you break that pleural cavity seal and then you'll get some collapse of lungs. But if you just get a liver shot, the, it, it's basically going to be blood loss. So if we have a look here at this diagram, so first of all, the liver, the bulk of the liver is on the right side. The tail of the liver comes out further on the left side, but it's much, much smaller. Now, again, very similar, the big blood vessels come into the liver and the liver has a tremendously big blood flow. It's one of our po most important metabolic structures in the body. Uh, so it has a lot of blood supply. Now, if you happen to hit and you come close to those big blood vessels that are coming in and out of the liver, the blood loss is going to happen very quickly and you know it's not going to last very long and it just simply dies from hypovolemia and blood loss and how long are you talking if you hit right on that intersection there you know it, it's not going to be as quick as a double <clears throat> shot um so you're talking you I mean it may be just several minutes or you know as i mentioned if the further you get out in the periphery of the liver the smaller the blood vessels are Peripherally. So if you get a, a liver shot, even if it goes right through the liver, but it's further towards the outer part, the periphery, the blood loss is going to be a lot slower. And then those animals, uh, you know, can take a much longer time, you know, potentially even, uh, you know, hours before they can actually die from blood loss. Pretty unlikely that if you, you, do anything more than maybe nick the liver um, but if it goes through the liver almost certainly it's going to be die from blood loss it's just the timing is going to be so variable so i mean you see that you made a liver shot when if you've ever done this or you will do it it's very obvious what you see on your arrow is liver blood um, and you would know by where you believe you hit the animal. It's always further back, kind of middle of the body is where you start getting afraid of that liver territory. But like you say, if you hit them right in this intersection here, they can die very quickly. But if you're two inches out, it can take hours. So the safe bet is to take your time back out, right? Nobody's ever lost an animal because they've waited too long. So, you know, the biggest thing that we have in the excitement and you know is we we just want to get there we want to find that animal and patience is tough when you're in that situation you made the hit and you just have to tell yourself you got to sit back and wait and how long you know part of that will depend on how confident you are in terms of where you actually believe that you placed that shot now if you happen to have it videoed you know, that's fantastic because you can go back, look at the video and, you know, actually visualize where you think that you hit that and then base your judgment uh, partly on that. And again, you know, understanding the anatomy and how that shot actually kills in different situations, you know, will help you make your decision. I've made a mistake. I mean, a few years ago, it was the I was chasing the biggest black bear that I had ever had the opportunity to hunt. I had him on private land, on camera, pretty reliably for a month and a half there, and finally got an arrow into this bear, hit him a little far forward, hour probably till till dark, and I was 
somewhat confident about it but knew it wasn't a great shot i went back to the truck and i called one of my best friends jonah and he said come home go to bed and we'll go out in the morning to look but i just i had too much emotion attached to that animal it was a it was a big bear and i worked so hard for it i convinced him and myself that we should look that night i should have listened to him and what we ended up finding was maybe 120 yards from the shot site a what looked like a bedding area full of blood and my arrow the back half of my arrow broken off laying in it and we would have spooked that bear out of that bed i'm sure of it and we never found the bear beyond that so the move would have been back out come back in the morning if you're worried about meat spoilage well meat spoilage is less of a problem than not finding your animal period one thing i've heard before is just regarding what we talked about earlier where you know one animal on a double lung goes 20 yards and one goes 150 yards is one thing I've heard, I don't know if it's true, is if they're full of air, when you shoot them, that has a different impact on if they're on the exhale when you shoot them. Do you think there's any truth to that? Um, you know, I think that's a very minor factor. It's the two factors that we talked about, you know, how quickly the lungs are going to collapse because that animal is still going to try to inhale, exhale. And I mean, this is happening in a matter of just seconds so that's really not going to be much of a factor at all okay so then another one for you um we've all seen the videos of elk and moose when you shoot them i mean it's quite common when you shoot particularly the elk and moose that you shoot them and they take a few steps and they wobble and then go down but you shoot a whitetail i doubt anyone's ever seen a whitetail do that ever sometimes they'll run like hell and then and then stop but they never you know shot look at you take a few steps like why why do some animals behave that way when they're shot and some don't so again you know a lot of that has got to do with uh shot placement you know obviously if you hit spine they're not going anywhere um but the difference in character it, it character genetics just what's innate to that animal uh i was just last week hunting caribou up in nunavut and you know, it, it's just amazing the difference between different species. Those caribou, very curious, not stupid, but just curious. So their program to run away from wolves and bears, but their, their brain hasn't been programmed to run away from the human beings. So they're very curious and, you know, we, a number of them, it was a lot of fun. You know, they'll come closer, they'll circle around. Can't get really close to them. I mean, bow hunters can if they take a lot of time, but it's just a different character of the animal. So a white tail, um, double lung shot, and I've done it, you know, perfectly through both lungs and they just run until they fall in a hundred yards. A moose, they will not do that. Double lung shot, I've done it. I mean, they may take a step or two and they'll just teeter and then fall. So it's just, <clears throat> that's a different animal and their behavior is just different. Yeah, it is interesting. Hunting a whitetail is totally different than hunting a mule deer. Oh yeah. Just because their behaviors are just so totally different. So it's, they're just different animals. Well, it is. I mean, whitetail and mule deer are so different. It's amazing because, you know, non-hunters could never tell the difference between the two. But as a bow hunter, I would be very hesitant to take a shot at a whitetail past 30 yards because they jump their reaction time is just so incredible but a mule deer i mean you can throw arrows at them from quite some distance it's it's really interesting so so that's a good point um so we've covered heart and lung i mean heart and lung I, you don't have if you're very confident you've made that lung shot you have all the telltale signs your blood trail is going to open up fairly quickly you should be able to see it you know i i take my time a little bit i, I pick up my arrow i take pictures maybe send him a text or give him a call take my little bit of time but you don't need to wait hours if you have all the signs you can pretty much follow the red carpet to your animal liver shot like you mentioned they may or may not die fairly quickly but you need to play it safe like we talked about with my bear story not that that was a liver shot but i didn't play it safe and i lost an animal because of it now a gut shot another one that's extremely obvious when you've made that shot and you will find your arrow I'd say more than nine times out of 10 with a gut shot because there's, there's nothing in there to stop your arrow. They, it, your arrows go through it. Um, so I guess we're kind of working through this in progression from best shot to the shots you don't want to make. But 
if you know you've made a gut shot and that's where your arrow is telling you, what is your plan of action? Well, you know, give them a little bit of time, let them uh, get sick, let them hurt a lot because what they'll do is they'll go and then they're going to want to lay down and you know it you know it might be depending you know there's a lot of areas but it's possible you may never gut shot may never find it so it may take an animal if with just the gut shot it may take a day or two before they actually die from infection and sepsis so you know it's it's always a judgment you know do you try to follow them hope that you can find them get another shot my personal philosophy and and tell me if you think i'm wrong because i might be but if i shoot them in the guts it's pretty much i'm waiting till the next day um if i'm hunting wide open country you have a little bit more leeway to go look from afar and see if you can locate them but most of us are hunting you know bears and whitetail and in the bush if i'm hunting whitetail and i know i made a gut shot i don't really care what time of day it is i'm coming back the next day um because like you say different animals have different almost personalities right there might be one that goes and lays down and feels sorry for itself in not too long and you don't want to push it there might just be an animal that runs four miles and it doesn't matter what you did you're never going to find it mm -hmm. do you have anything to add to that and you're not going to know you're not going to know if you started following it sooner whether you're going to happen to find it laying there sick and you're going to get a shot at it uh, you're not going to know if it would lay there, then get up, then lay. And we, I've seen it. Uh, you know, when they move further, they lay, lay down because you can see the blood. They get up, they move, and, you know, by the next day, it might be miles away. And so there's just, there's not a good answer to that one. Well, I mean, you're right. We've seen it. Hunting this coos deer in Mexico. Um, I, I shot that coos deer on the sixth day, and they are so flighty so skittish i shot and i honestly had no idea where my arrow hit i just saw him take off and run and made it like about 40 50 yards over a little hill and i couldn't see anymore so i just played it safe i <clears throat> felt like it was a pretty good shot but honestly no idea i waited an hour i went looking for it came up over that little mound i saw him go over i i saw him laying there great start celebrating i walked up and i got five yards from this uh, this coos deer right here and he lifted his head and looked at me and I'm like fumbling around you know try to get an arrow he, in a second he's gone and he only made it about 40 yards and started doing that death wobble and I watched him go down but that is sheer luck that I recovered that animal because I didn't wait long enough um, I wasn't sure where my shot was I should have waited longer and that's where Frank Noska told us you've no one's ever lost an animal by waiting too long so um, you know just adding to that I mean there's not a lot more to add to that but you know if you are able to go where you shot it where it was standing and if you're able to find that arrow um, you know you can get those little pieces of information but the fact that it was a pass-through that is such a bonus whereas if you the arrow's not there and it's still in the animal or fell out or broke off or whatever uh, you know, then, it, then you have to have a little more patience in those situations and, you know, it all comes down to judgment. Yeah. Judgment experience, which I make mistakes every year and learn every year. So don't feel bad about making mistakes. It happens, but when in doubt, wait it out is a, is a good rule to live by with blood trailing. The question that came up before was what makes a good blood trail or not such a good blood trail. And you know, honestly, it's really not as much of a factor of which broadhead you happen to use. You know, cutting diameters, total <coughs> cut, sure, that's a factor, but you know, the biggest factor unquestionably is getting that pass through, getting the penetration. <coughs> uh, because a pass through will be more lethal and is absolutely gonna give you a better blood uh, trail than if you don't <coughs> get that pass through uh, plus as we mentioned you know a quicker kill but the other thing that is probably bigger than anything is if you hit a big blood vessel and there's a lot of blood loss absolutely you're going to get a much better uh, blood trail I mean I've seen it you know where you following an elk and you know in the snow you can see blood spurting yeah. 
feet, feet away from where that animal happened to walk. It's so cool when you got the blood. Uh, if you had them happen to hit them somewhere where it's not a big vessel, even if it's a double lung shot, you're just not going to have that kind of a blood trail. So it's it's not correct that the broad head makes the blood trail. What's correct is the <laughs> penetration and which blood vessels you happen to hit that make a blood trail. So, I mean, that's a great point you make too. And I, I try to drive that point home when you call me or email me at Tooth of the Arrow, I will tell you that penetration is the biggest factor. And there's a lot of pushback on that from people who are like, well, that, that one inch head is too small. It makes me nervous. The way I like to think about it is the one inch head, let's just talk about our lineup. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of broadheads out there, but just from what we have here, we have the one inch head and the one and three sixteenths inch head. They're both great broadheads, but the one inch head is going to penetrate better than the one and three sixteenths. So if you're worried about the power coming out of your bow, if you're a lower poundage, lower draw weight, lighter arrow, penetration needs to be your focal point because an arrow that penetrates further actually does more cutting than a wider broadhead that doesn't go as far. It's just doing more cutting but on a different axis, right? Instead of a wider cut, it's doing a longer cut, you could say. So um, that's a really big factor to think about when you're, when you're selecting broadheads. And the XL is great if you have that power. I mean, I shoot 71 pounds at 30 and a half inches, 525 or 30 grain arrow. I have no problem with that power on something like a whitetail. I'll shoot the bigger head all day long, but it's something from you and from me that we want you to be aware of. Like penetration is the biggest thing period. And accuracy, of course. Accuracy first and foremost, but penetration means more than cut diameter. There, there may be an advantage to a slightly um, narrower broad head, two blade. It's less likely going to get slowed down by a rib if you're going <clears throat> through the ribs. Well, yeah, I mean, the smaller broad head has less surface area when it encounters problems such as shoulders and ribs, there's a greater chance of smaller surface area making its way through, which what this all comes down to is if you get a pass through on an accurate shot, that is your best chance of finding your animal, period. So that's what we always wanna go for here. Um, so we've covered everything except the, I mean a spine shot, there's no, we're not gonna get into that because it's bittersweet, you know you got it, but the job isn't done, but your animal's there. Muscle shots. Kind of the bow hunter's worst nightmare in a sense. Maybe, not, I don't know, would I rather hit the guts or the muscle? I don't know. They're both awful shots to make, but um, let's talk about it. You know, if it's just a muscle shot, um, you know, you may be, have been very lucky in a hip um, to happen the one of the big iliac vessels. And if you happen to hit a big vessel, the animal's gonna die. And it's not gonna take very long to die. But if it's just in muscle and there's not a lot of bleeding, uh, you know, that animal may survive. Now, if the arrow of the broad head is still in there and stuck in there and doesn't happen to fall out, you know, then it's going to get an infection. And, you know, there's no question that people have found arrows, broad heads or whatnot a year down the road and have managed to heal. But... If it gets an infection, and especially if there's the wick of the arrow um, that doesn't allow a healing, a closure, and if they can fight it, that animal is gonna die from just sepsis and infection at some point. But it, it could be a long time. It's not likely an animal you're gonna find. Um, and muscle shots are funny when you, when you shoot an animal in the muscle and you look at your arrow, sometimes you won't actually see anything. Sometimes you'll see very light streaks of pink. Sometimes it'll feel a little waxy just from the fat that it's passed through. You can pretty much always tell by smelling it, even if there isn't much presenting on your arrow. Um, it'll, it smells like meat. It smells like steak basically, but it's not a good thing. And if I've, and I have done that once that I can remember for sure, shot a mule deer doe right through muscle. That was it. Back out next day, come back. But I mean, that's a sleepless night because you to an extent, you know what you're into, but you have to do your due diligence and look. Just because you've hit 
guts or muscle and you know the odds are low, you have to put your time in and look for that animal because things happen. You might find them. You might be surprised. Yeah, and it's only fair to that animal. And if you happen to, you know, the next day, next morning, find them wounded, um, you got to try to kill that animal. Yeah, you do. You got you to gotta do everything you can. And, and you know, another thing I would like to mention just about those bad shots that you lose an animal, it's important to always look back and think about what you could have done differently. It is for a lot of us, and, and understandably so, easy to blame equipment, say, well, my sight was off, or blah, 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 or the broadhead didn't work, or, or whatever, But and, and that may be the case, but I think it's really important to always try to look back and think about what you could have done differently in that situation, because um, it's it doesn't matter if it's a 180-inch whitetail or a, or a doe. It's, it's an animal's life, and it matters a lot. You know, and even when things turn out really, really good, you know, it's important to just analyze what you did. Three weeks ago, I was in Russia in a snow sheep, and, you know, a bit of a story, but it was coming up over a bluff. We were stalking it, and it was moving, and I was down on a bipod shooting with a rifle, and, you know, you always judge, you know, the movement, leading, etc. so I shot it, and... Uh, had my crosshairs just really far forward on the chest and it dropped. I mean, it didn't take a step and it dropped. However, in analyzing and when we skin it out and butch it out and you do the autopsy, um, it was probably moving faster than I had judged. So I hit it further back and it went up <clears throat> into the spine and it just dropped. So I mean, it was an instant kill. But I still made a mistake and that I just I didn't quite correctly judge the how quickly it was moving and and how much um, you know further I should have aimed at that animal so just while we're here and telling stories because uh, you don't do a lot of these um, tell everybody about um, what happened on your Marco Polo hunt well this the incredible you know never going to happen again it was sort of a one in a million but in tajikistan the marco polo they're they're you don't get close to the animal they're distant shots they're so anyway this mount this marco polo was going up the mountain away we'd sort of come around it stalked around it uh it was set up uh, the guy had said, you know, third one, because there's a group of one, third one from the back. And he was calling out ranges as I was trying to get lined up on them, uh, moving. So, of course, I aim high up on the shoulder, uh, pulled the trigger, and he dropped and just rolled down the mountain, because these mountains are pretty steep. So, climb up to where he was, and, you know, he was laying there with bowel coming out his anus did all the caping and everything, there was no blood, no bullet hole. Literally, the boat went right through the anus, hit the pelvic bones and tore the vessels. I mean, it was just, you know, an almost instant kill. But there was no bullet hole. Absolutely amazing. And just yeah. blind luck. That wasn't skill by any means. It was just total blind luck. Yeah, you would never aim for that. But, you I mean, you got a perfect cape with no holes in it, so... Uh, hard to complain, but again, not not even a shot we're going to cover here because we just hope that you're not trying to do that. Um, but yeah, but again, it is funny. You know, again, you know, it was an it almost instant yeah. kill, but I again misjudged it. You know, I didn't. I aimed right way up high in its shoulder, right behind his neck, but I still didn't judge the the distance quite correctly. I should have aimed in front of him and would have been a better judgment um so sometimes you just get lucky sometimes you get lucky in there you can learn something from every bullet or arrow you send you can learn something from it yeah um yeah there's very few even perfect kills that you can't actually learn something from that you don't that you think that was perfect you know you can always try to learn something to do a little better so one thing that I, when we get back to just the archery side of this and the technical archery side, for for years now, this is the way I've built all my arrows. This is one of my arrows from this year. Um, I always do a white wrap with white veins because of exactly this. This gives me a lot of information. Even if I made a, a muscle shot and there's 
almost nothing to see. I have a better chance of seeing it on this than any other color you can throw on here. Yes, I do lose some arrows in snow and that's a bit of a pain, but that's why I shoot a blue knot because blue is very unnatural in nature. Um, but this is something to think about. I've been able, I, I don't have any issues reading what my arrow is showing me with this particular setup. Um, and with the white veins and white wrap, you can also see very clearly where your arrow hits on animals. Um, more often than not, obviously things happen very quickly, but on a dark animal, white tail, black bear, elk, moose, whatever, you can see this really well. When I was mountain goat and doll sheep hunting, this did not help me <laughs> on seeing where my arrow hit. But in most cases, this is a, this is a really cool setup to think about for just helping yourself do better blood trailing. So that about covers it for this video today. We did get a number of questions off the last video, which we replied to individually, but once we get some more from this video, we'll come back and we'll do another video, which is just me shutting up and him answering your questions, basically. Um, so, so we'll do that next. If you guys ask questions, we'll get to them. Um, let us know what you thought. You guys seem to really like the last video. I hope you guys like this one too. Um, be sure to subscribe and thank you for watching. Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, there we go.